Since 1983, fame has helped business and education work for Maine. Contact the authority, the finance authority of Maine. Welcome. This is our afterthought segment that we uh, do after we've done our regular broadcast segment. We keep our guests around for some more in-depth and hopefully candid conversation about some of the issues we didn't get to. Today we're broadcasting from the uh, Powering Up Maine Symposium at the University of Southern Maine in Portland, and we have with us today Steve Ward, Maine's public advocate from 1986 to 2007, and Carol Lee, former president of Bangor Hydroelectric Company. Gentlemen, thank you for coming and sticking thank around. You. Uh, yeah, so. Afterthoughts. What are your afterthoughts? I had one afterthought, but first I had to make a, sort of a preface okay. statement, which is during the 25 years that I worked at the Public Advocate's Office, I was in on many of the decisions that we're now in retrospect right. identifying as flawed decisions. Right. So there's plenty of blame to be shared, and I accept my, my share of it. Um, what would you have done differently? Well, uh, let me first switch to something that okay. we did right. Okay, good. Um, one of the good things about restructuring, which was intended and actually was achieved, is Maine's power mix is much more renewable these days, much more environmentally benign. Natural gas is a much better fuel to burn than number six fuel oil, for example. Cleaner. Cleaner. And uh, the existence of wind turbines across the state right now and demonstration units for tidal power and so on are all a result of opportunities created by restructuring itself. Um, incentives in the main legislature, but the fact that it was no longer a utility monopoly, instead it was open up, opened up to anyone who could finance a power plant. Um, that has been a plus, and although Maine has lost, Maine Yankee, as Carol has pointed out, we've lost a non-emitting greenhouse gas resource, uh, there are real opportunities now for other non-emitting greenhouse gas resources mm -hmm. in the renewable sector. Okay, good. Uh, well, I yes, comment on that. I take Steve's point, but I, I fear that the renewable resources that we're trying to develop in the state are, are going to be too expensive for people to be able to afford. Uh, and renew we've had renewable resources in this state for, for many years. And we're talking, in this case, you're talking about wind? Hydro. We, we've hydro. had hydro. We, you know, yeah. when, I, when, I, when I began my career at Bangor Hydro, the utilities had developed a, a hugely successful hydroelectric system, providing then probably 30% of the power of the state. And it was low cost. Right. Uh, so it helped. It helped rates, it helped the economy of the state uh, to do that. Today, today, today we, we're, we're trying to develop renewables that are relatively a lot more expensive. And, and, and the way we're doing that is, is, is providing subsidies and mandates so that uh, the developers of these facilities are able to finance them even though they're expensive to build in remote lo locations. And, but some of those subsidies and mandates, they're, 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 they're tax, tax subsidies and they're ratepayer subsidies. So it's going to tend to increase the price of electricity. For example, the, the Maine's uh, renewable energy mandate is 40 percent. Right. Uh, 40 percent of the electricity by... in Maine has to be, I think it's by 2020. Okay. Now, the average mandate throughout the U.S. is 10 percent. Okay, so if you, if you believe uh, that renewables are going to be relatively more expensive, uh, the more that you mandate, the more expensive the, the power will be. And, and in Maine... More expensive than... Natural gas-fired power plants. Those yes, or or other sources okay. as well, and and, and in Maine, uh, uh, the, the, the legislation the PUC has established a premium uh, of six cents per up to six cents per kilowatt hour that can be paid to the developers of renewable resources as a, as something in addition to what they, they would right. normally uh, get by delivering into the marketplace, and that's that premium has to be paid for by someone. And, and it's paid for by the ratepayer. Yeah. So over time, that's that's a potential problem. Uh, shouldn't, it, shouldn't it be cheaper? Shouldn't it be easier? Tidal and wind in particular? Well, the initial investment in any power plant cost. is significant. Yeah. And the investment makes sense only when it's paid off over a long period of time. But won't we always use less than we produce in Maine? Yeah, we have Can a we surplus, and we'll be contributing the surplus to the rest of New England. Can that benefit homeowners and businesses, then? It's very difficult to capture that surplus <laughs> in ways right. that translate directly into lower costs. For is customers. that an ISO, ISO New England issue? It's essentially a federal interstate commerce oh, okay. ISO New England problem. But let me make one other ahead, point. Sorry, yeah. Carol uh, very sensibly pointed out that when natural gas prices are high, in general, we see our rates trend up. Right. But when natural gas prices are low, we're happier than you know, other folks, other places. Well, renewables actually decrease that volatility. The larger the piece of the pie that's not natural gas, right. non-fossil fuel, uh, the greater the likelihood actually that those swings will be diminished. And I, I see that as a plus. Good. Um, 
So I, I'm talking about a little bit about the politics of all this, I guess. I mean, this is it, it's an election year. We're the, sitting here at the middle of October. That's right. You've heard about year. that, right? This yeah, I've heard about that. Uh, everything's being thrown out. Energies, and I, we were talking before the show that uh, the surveys that are done, Maine Development Foundation and the Chamber of Commerce did their surveys of businesses, and the businesses are always saying, you know, when they look at the, the things that impact their businesses negatively, number one is healthcare costs, number two is the cost of energy, and then cost of regulations. Is that mix ever going to change? And, and what can you say to businesses out there? How can they predict their, what should they be planning for? Well, let, let me take a crack at that. Okay. I mean, I've, I've looked at this, this issue, and, and you know, the cost of energy is a significant issue for the state of Maine. Uh, about 15% 15 per, 15 of the income in the state of Maine is spent for energy. If you look at that percentage throughout the U.S., it's only 10%. 10 so it's 50% it's greater uh, cost uh, as a percentage of income in the state of Maine. Is that household income you, you, you're talking about? Or? Yeah, average okay. total income. And it, okay. you, you compare that to state, ta uh, state taxes, are only around 14% of income. So it's more than all of our state taxes together. And health care costs are around 20%. So those three large uh, costs that Maine people are incur incurring are all kind of part of the politics that yeah, you know, we, we hear about it. But isn't, don't we like, don't businesses love to beat up on energy costs? Isn't that the, the, it's the safest thing to punch at all the time? And Because nobody likes paying the electric bill, and it is high, but relatively speaking, there has been some, some changes. Our, in New England, our rates are... Uh, Maine's rates are lower than other parts than of they, New England. Uh, parts of New England, and better, and approaching, they were 48% of uh, over the, so, the national right, average in 1999, and now it's closer to 20%. So something good is happening, but boy, sure doesn't feel like that. Well, it, I... I'm somebody who figures that it's important to be as candid as possible Please. about the negatives. Yeah. And I, I think Maine faces a number of negatives that will never be completely overcome. And one of them is we don't have coal deposits, right. we don't have big federal investments in hydroelectricity, and we don't have federally subsidized nuclear power plants like are being proposed in the southeast of the United States right now. So the upshot is it's an uphill climb for us to be able to bring rates right down to the national average. That's going to be very, very hard to do. Well, my memory is long. Okay. And, and, and when I began my career in, the, in, the, in 1970, mm -hmm. and through, the, through the early 1980s, our rates were approaching the national average. Why was that the case? Yeah. Did because we have coal then or something? Well, we developed low-cost resources from Maine. Hydro. Yeah. We, 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 we built the first international transmission line between Canada and, and New England. Uh, we, we constructed Maine Yankee. And uh, we helped to form the New England Power Pool in order to create a, a more efficient regional uh, system. So those strategies, actually, we were able, very successful in keeping our, our rates close to the national average in right. the 1980s. And since then, we've uh, you know, we made some other choices that turned out, in retrospect, not to be good choices relative to, to energy that led to restru the restructuring. You know, it's an interesting branding issue, too, with Maine in terms of economic development and where we want to go over the next, you know, the energy issues and energy policy. That's long-term stuff, as you guys know. Right. So, you know, we're looking at what's going to happen over the next 25 years. Uh, and if we start investing in, so yeah, let's start stepping our toe back into nuclear. Let's, let's talk about hydro again, those kinds of things. Does that fit with the brand now? And how does that work? You know, it's, a, it's a complex issue in terms of the politics involved, the branding involved, and how we compete with other states. True, uh, I, I think brand is, a, is certainly an issue, but also uh, the economy of the states is a, is a big issue as well. Yeah, I mean, the Brookings Institute was all about quality of place and quality of life. Well, if you can afford to do business here and make a profit, that's a good that's quality right. of life, that's right? It right. seems to me if you can open the door to certain types of Canadian imports and yeah. find ways of transmitting the power without raising rates for Mainers to some uh, painful level, then you do have access to a renewable resource that does fit our brand. How much actual impact can a governor and a legislature have? Not much in the short term. Yeah. Long term, a big influence. I so think. what would so they do I, to have long term influence? Well, long term influence, for example, is for, uh, consideration of should we continue on with a, the with a total deregulation of the industry or should we uh, re-regulate part of it so we have, have control over the development of assets that, that can be kept in the state. Yeah. We have. We have a lot of assets in the state that used to be owned by uh, the utilities, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you could set up an, a, a public power authority to do the same thing. Wow. You could do other, other yeah, forms, of, a, uh, forms of structure. It's classic pendulum time. It swings out, will it swing back? It would Steve? require action in the legislature to effectively repeal or largely restructure, restructuring. And I'm not sure we're at a point where there's a consensus that's what needs to happen. Whether you call it restructuring or deregulation, either way. Pretty interesting stuff. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you all.